Okay. okay. You're on. Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Craig Dubinsky and we are at Anola Church of God and we are studying the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are tonight in Revelation chapter 10 and we will be looking at the little scroll in this Bible study. We're also looking at the two witnesses and these are two very important individuals that God uses in some very fantastic ways in the Word of God. So welcome to all those that are here tonight and those of you that are watching on Facebook Live and to you, those of you who will be watching on Sunshine TV YouTube. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we're opening up your word now in Revelation 10. We pray that you will block the external distractions from our ears and our, and our sight and the internal distractions from within and help us to concentrate and focus on you, God. We are here tonight to worship you by learning more about you and your world and your plan for all of us as it is laid out for us in the Word of God, and in particular, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, speak to us tonight. Correct us where we need to be corrected and comfort us where we need to be comforted because we are looking to you, our great healer, our great nurturing, caring, loving God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to make a correction. I made a mistake about two weeks ago. Craig made a mistake. Well, look at all that surprise. <laughs> uh, actually, I was uh, talking about Hebrew and Greek, and I got a little carried away, <clears throat> and I said that in Hebrew, as in uh, Greek, there is no J or excuse me, H, there is no H. And then I was talking with somebody afterwards and uh, I looked it up and I have the Hebrew alphabet right here. Uh, I not only learned the Hebrew alphabet, but I had to sight read from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, um, any portion of it for my final exam for Hebrew in, in seminary. So um, I am familiar with the language somewhat, not, from, not greatly, but there is an H, and in English it's pronounced H-A-Y, so I was wrong about that. Okay, what I did is I got it confused with Greek. There is no H in Greek, okay? Uh, a long time ago, I wrote some Greek up on this board, and I taught you the difference between a rough breathing mark and a smooth breathing mark, yeah. and both of them look like commas above the word. Mm -hmm. And the uh, smooth breathing mark is just a, an accent, but the rough breathing mark is the H sound. So if you have the word hoy in Greek, and there is a hoy, it does not begin with H because there is no H. It begins with omicron, iota, which is in English O-I, but then when you put that rough breathing mark above the omicron, that gives you the H sound. So my apologies, I made a mistake there. There most definitely is an H in Hebrew, and I have it right here for those of you that would like to see it. I have it right here, okay? We would, we would have never known the difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there was one person here who knew the difference and spoke with me and said, you know, are you sure there's no H? I'm like, well, let's find out, because I had this in my notebook, and I pulled it out, and I'm like, <laughs> There is an H. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm like, I got to go eat a piece of humble pie oh. and let everybody know that I um, goofed. But it's not the first time. And if you don't believe me on that, just ask Pam. She's a witness. <laughs> She'll testify to all my goofs, well, right? It won't be the last time either. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be the last time either. And you're absolutely right. You did smack somebody on Nationwide TV at least. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So... Uh, we are in Bible study number eight. Now, I have just passed out Bible study number nine, and it's in front of you on the table. All you need to do is just put that in your notebook, pay attention to the numbers, because I do not do the Bible study by dates. I do not do the Bible study by 
Bible passages. I do it by sequence. Okay, so number eight is the two witnesses, Revelation 10, 1 through eleven nineteen, part one. And uh, following this is number nine, which is part two of this text. So we are in Revelation 10, and we will be looking at verses one to three in just a moment. But first, um, notice on your sheet, it says illustration, the two witnesses, prophecy, study, Bible, Tim LaHaye. Everybody see that? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to take out this sheet, I'm holding it off, the two witnesses. Should be in the back of the packet. There's a bunch of sheets. In the back of number eight. Okay. Um... Actually, Mark, you have Bible study number nine. Look at the last page of Bible study number nine, because it's on there, too. I had it in there twice. Okay, so everybody got it? Everybody know where I am? Okay, so we're going to read through this right now. Two of the most colorful characters in all of biblical prophecy may be supernatural prophets that burst on the scene during the first half of the tribulation. According to the 11th chapter of Revelation... These two characters, dressed in sackcloth, prophesy, dispense astonishing miracles, and witness to the grace of God in the most evil culture known to man. There is much speculation as to the identity of these two witnesses. Now, if you remember, we talked about this last week, and we went through some material from uh, John MacArthur, and I gave you all of the Bible passages that went with that, okay, uh, which he did not do. And that was right from this book, which is Revelation of the Study Guide. And that's the page uh, right out of his book. But I looked up all the verses, and these are all passages last week. You need to know these passages. You really do. You really need to give it a little time, because that's the biblical proof. This is another um, um, explanation of it. Could someone read that second paragraph nice and loud for me? Mark. Though some believe Elijah and Enoch are the two witnesses, most Bible scholars consider them to be Moses and Elijah. Proponents of the Moses and Elijah argument point out that these two Old Testament characters were the most influential Hebrew men of their respective times. Moses introduced God's written law to Israel, while Elijah was the first of the writing prophets and even started the school of the prophets. In fact, whenever the Jews said Moses and Elijah, they usually meant the law and the prophets. One factor that may suggest Moses and Elijah will be the two witnesses mentioned in Revelation is that the two men accompanied Jesus at the Transfiguration in Matthew 17. Another element is that the miracles of the witnesses are to produce that another element is that the miracles the witnesses are to produce have striking similarities to the judgment plagues initiated by Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament in Exodus 7 through 12 and 1 Kings 17 1. Now you notice that some of the material that you're reading now is uh, duplicated it's because it was part of the other material that I already gave you but some of this material is new was not in the other uh, handout, and that's the part that another view is Elijah and Enoch. Another thing that's new that wasn't in the material before is the fact that uh, Elijah started the school of the prophets. Okay, that that's pretty significant. Okay, so those are two two points that weren't in the previous handout. So the next paragraph, beginning with together. Uh, who would like to read that? I will. Thank you. Together with the 144,000 witnesses, the two witnesses of Revelation 11 will have awesome power and impact in producing an enormous soul harvest of the first 42 months of the tribulation described in Revelation 7. They will provide the millions of Jews in the Holy Land, a spiritual bridge to the Christian gospel. God will demonstrate his mighty power and assistance 
to these two prophets over whom the Antichrist will have no power until the God appointed time. Before that assigned deadly time, the two witnesses will be untouchable, and anyone who threatens them will be killed. Thank you, Pam. So, so you see that God's going to use these two people in the Holy Land. Those of you that have Facebook, uh, I have pictures of my first uh, tour that I led to the Holy Land, and Pam accompanied me in that uh, tour, and that was 1990. And those pictures were just put up on Facebook today, and you'll see pictures of Pam on a camel, you'll see pictures of Pam smooching with a camel, <laughs> a close-up, you'll see some fascinating uh, things, you'll see us uh, in front of a statue of Elijah uh, on one of the mountains, uh, and uh, the Holy Land, if you ever get a chance to go, and some of you I know have already been, but if you get a chance to go, it is uh, phenomenal. It will help the Bible become alive because you will have walked the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows. You will have, could have walked or you could, can walk the seven stations of the cross. You can uh, sail across the Sea of Galilee like Jesus did. Pam and I did. I preached a message from my little Gideon New Testament on the ship, and uh, um, it was a replica of the ship that is believed to be the, the type of ship that Jesus was on, and uh, it really opens things up. The, the handout says, the two prophets make mortal enemies of the Antichrist, and those who reject Christ and worship the beast during the first half, or 100, uh, 1260 days of the tribulation. For reasons known only to God, the Lord will allow the Antichrist to overcome and kill the two witnesses once they have finished their testimony. We're going to get to that in the next Bible study, and you're also going to find out that they refuse to bury them. And you're going to learn from Jewish law that the most despicable thing that one Jew can do to another is forbid their burial or to um, um, restrict their burial, because that's very important in the Jewish mind. And uh, these uh, prophets are left out for decay and decomposition for three days. And uh, the Antichrist will not allow anyone to bury them. We're going to get to that in a little while. The paragraph that begins, Then the unsaved people. Who would like to read that for me? I'll read it for you. Thank you. Then the unsaved people of the world who so despise the witnesses will refuse to bury them leaving their dead bodies to decay in the streets of Jerusalem. They will even make a Christmas-like celebration out of their murders by sending and receiving gifts in honor of the occasion. John prophesies that they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three, and a half, three days and a half. Revelation 11, 9 emphasizes, emphasizes that it. How could the whole world see their dead bodies? Only a short time ago would have been humanly inconceivable for the whole world to witness such events. But today, with rapid advancements in communication technology, such a spectacle is not so difficult to imagine. Thank you. And the last paragraph says, But the most incredible aspect of Revelation 11 is that the story doesn't end with the death of the two witnesses. God predicted that while the world is watching... He will do a mighty miracle. He will raise the two prophets from the dead and take them up to heaven. This event will be a loving gesture by God Almighty, not only to resurrect and take to, have, take to heaven his two prophets, but also to make his existence and power known around the world. And with our satellite TV and our satellite technology for the whole world to see this will be super easy. Yeah. And so that's a little bit more. Uh, I have another handout for you, and I'm really pounding the pulpit on these two, because you're going to see that they're going to do some things that um, you haven't even imagined yet. I mean, you really need to spend a little time uh, reflecting and meditating on what these two witnesses really mean. Because there is a literal meaning, that is, they are literal people, 
But there's, it's a little deeper than that. And when we get into the prophecy, uh, the double fulfillment of prophecy, you'll see how uh, the two witnesses are not only literal, but they're also metaphorical. It's not either or, it's both. And you'll see how that works a little later. So hang on to everything about these two witnesses because more is coming. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, chapter 10, verse 1. I'm reading from Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 through 3, and it says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And that is as far as we're going to go with that right now. Now, first thing we're going to look at is another mighty angel in verse 1. Who is this? Who is this? John? What? Christ. Okay. Some people believe that. Hang on to that. Let me read John MacArthur first on this. Another mighty angel. Many commentators understand this to be Jesus Christ. But the Greek word translated another means one of the same kind that is in created being. Now before I finish this footnote, let me tell you a couple of things about how Greek works. Greek is a very, very specific language, unlike English. English, compared to Koine Greek, is very vague because some of the words mean so many different things. And in English, some English words mean one thing, and they can also mean their opposite. Okay? The word cleave is one of them. What do you do when you cleave a piece of meat? You cut it. You separate it. But in English, in Genesis it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And in that context, cleave means to cling, not to separate. So there's an English word that has two definitions that are totally opposite, and both are true depending on the context. Greek is not that ambiguous. Greek is real specific. So, this is one of the cases in point. So, the word another in Greek, there are several words for that, and two of them means another of the same kind, and another Greek word for another means another of a different kind. Okay? And that has some real significance um, um, theologically, remember when they came to um, 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 to John the Baptist and they said, are you the one who should come or should we look for what? Another in the, in the English. And the, that word another is another of a different kind. In other words, not like you, but somebody totally different. Remember, John the Baptist ate honey and locusts and wore, ha wore um, camel, was it camel hair or locust hair or some kind of hair? I mean, he was a real rural guy, <laughs> wasn't he? He wasn't uh, like a lot of people. So the back to John MacArthur's comment, this is not one of the seven angels responsible for sounding the trumpets, chapter 8, verse 2, but one of the highest ranking in heaven filled with splendor, greatness, and strength. So on your sheet, I have, who is this? I have Jesus with a question mark. Then I have high-ranking angel with a question mark. Let's look at Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Revelation 1.1 1, 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to the, his servant John. And so we see the um, role of angels is to uh, do many different things, but in this case, it's to bring a message, 
Sometimes it's to bring understanding. In the book of Daniel, it's to bring an interpretation. I'm studying Daniel in my personal Bible study, and, um, and it shows that an angel in Daniel uh, brought an interpretation. Now, that wasn't the angel's interpretation. That's the interpretation that God gave the angel to deliver, that God gave the angel to, to share. Okay? So, according to John MacArthur, he, he sees it as a um, higher-ranking angel. Um, I, the Bible does not clearly state this point exactly. So you're not going to find a verse that's going to settle this one way or another. And so we need to pray, we need to study, we need to think. Um, but let me remind you of something. There's two mistakes that I see a lot theologically with preachers, churches, theologians, and Christians. Sometimes some more liberal types of, of uh, churches, pastors, and and Christians uh, tend to, uh, it seems like they pull Christ out of a lot of passages. You know, it seems like in some passages it's clearly Christ, but they're like, nah, I don't think so. It's really this, it's really that. And I, got, I, I have case, cases in point on this, not with me, but I do. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. Another mistake is to see Jesus everywhere through Scripture because every place in Scripture is not Jesus Christ. He is the master theme of the Bible. The, he is the main uh, character from Genesis to Revelation, but we got to be careful that we don't insert him in places that, um, unless it's clear, unless the Word of God verifies that's what it is. So, those people that believe it's Jesus, I have no problem with that. Those people that believe it's the highest ranking angel, um, I have no problem with that. Um, because it doesn't clearly state it. But um, it seems to me, my, my view, my opinion, is I see it as an angel. I see it as a high ranking angel. Because that seems to be the uh, modus operandi, or MO, all the way through the book of Revelation. Okay, you got angels, 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 angels. You got angels for here and there and everywhere in the Revelation, and you've got good angels, and you've got fallen angels, and you've got angels bringing messages, angels bringing um, uh, glory to God. And so you see, uh, angels are in the book of Revelation a lot, but can't be dogmatic, can't be sure. Okay. Any thoughts on that? Okay, good, good, good. So in verse 1, uh, it talks about a rainbow. Did you see that? And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. What does that rainbow remind you of? What does a rainbow remind you of? Noah. Noah. Yeah. Noah. Noah. Oh. The, the Noah Covenant. Exactly. Exactly. Now turn in your page uh, to Charlie Brown and Lucy. Those of you that are online and Facebook Live, this is the one I'm talking about. It's in your packet somewhere. I'm going to wait for you to get it. It's really good. It's really good. Important. I see Pam's got it. Might be on the back side of one of these pages. It's, on the, it's mine's on the back of that thing we just read about the two witnesses. Okay. On, all right. On the back yeah. part of that. Do you have it? No, I don't have that. Pack, but I'll, I'll get it later. Okay. Actually, I have another one right now. These are extra eight. Those are nine. And let me just see. Yep, it's in here as this other one is, and you can have that too. Okay. If you need that. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, Lucy and uh, Charlie Brown uh, are, um, or is that Lioness? I think that's Lioness. That's Lioness, okay. Lucy and Lioness are looking out the window and it's raining. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. And Lucy says, boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? 
And what does Lioness say? Somebody read Lioness. It will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is in the rainbow. And Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And somebody read what Lioness says. Sound theology has a way of doing that. Sound theology has a way of doing that. I love that. Okay? And that's what we want to have, sound theology. We don't want to make up speculations. We want to go back to the scripture, and we know that God used a rainbow as a sign of his Noahic covenant that he would not flood the world again. Is that right? Everybody with me? Okay, good. Good, good, good. So, also in verse 1, it talks about feet like pillars of fire. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. Notice that word like, like. Okay, it's talking about uh, a comparison. Let me see what John MacArthur has to say. John says, the angel's feet and legs indicate firm resolve with which he will execute the day of judgment. What I wrote in my notes in handwriting is stability and power. Stability and power. That's the picture of this feet uh, like pillars of fire. Stability and power. God's going to do mighty, mighty, miraculous things. Now we're on the top of page two. Everybody, if you look there, top of page two. While you're turning there, uh, John says about the rainbow, see 4.3, perhaps God included this to remind John that even in judgment, he will always remember his Noahic covenant and protect his own people. That's what John MacArthur says, and I think John's right. Okay, we all on page two. Yes. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to give you something to write. Top of the page to the right. This is not in your notes. I'm going to give this to you. It's four sentences. Notice underneath the little book it says the title deed to earth, and it says Christ has the legal authority and Christ has the final authority. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. To the right of that is some space, and I'm going to give you four um brief, real brief sentences, and I'm going to be talking about authority, and to make it easier, just use a capital A for authority, that way you'll have more room. Okay, number one. Oh, by the way, the title of this is called Authority of Jesus. That's what it is. So I, on my sheet, I wrote Authority of Jesus, I underlined it, and then I numbered one to four uh, vertically. Okay, so number one. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Number one. Authority recognized. So I just have a capital A and then recognized. And what you want to do is you want to skip a space, because I'm going to give you scripture, but I'm going to give it to you after I give you the, the statements. So skip a little bit, and then write a number two. And number two is authority given out. Authority given out, or capital A given out. You're going to see a progression here in a minute. Number three is authority and judgment, or A and J, of Jesus clarified. Authority and judgment of Jesus clarified. And you're skipping a space after each one of these so you can put the verses in. Everybody with me? Number four is authority, or capital A, confirmed by Jesus himself. Okay, so now we come to the scripture. Okay, so number one was authority recognized, and uh, underneath of that put teaching, and then Mark one twenty two. And then next to that, over demons, Luke 4.36. Over demons, Luke 4.36. So this is how the authority is recognized in these two ways. 
teaching Mark 122 over demons, Luke 436. Everybody with me? All right, number two was authority given out. That's Luke 9.1. Luke 9.1. Number three was authority and judgment of Jesus clarified, and that's John 5, 22 and 27. John 5, 22 and 27. And last but not least, authority confirmed by Jesus himself. Luke, excuse me, Matthew 28, 18. Matthew 28, 18. So I'm turning to Mark 1. We're going to walk through all these verses. Mark 1 and verse 22. So in verse 14, Jesus begins his ministry... And in verse 16, Jesus calls his first disciples. And in verse 21, Jesus heals a man with an unclean spirit. And somebody read Mark 1, 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. He taught them as one who had authority. So the people who are listening to him are seeing and hearing, identifying and recognizing the authority of the Son of God. And Luke 4.36. Luke 4.36. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they came out. Thank you. With authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they came out. So his authority of Jesus is recognized by his teaching, and the authority of Jesus is recognized by his power over demons. Now, look at Luke 9.1. The context of Luke 9 is Jesus is sending out the 12 apostles. That's what's going on here. Can somebody read 9-1 for me? And he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to notice. There's a momentum here, and there's a progression. So number one, his authority is recognized. Number two, his authority is now being granted. It's not only being recognized by his hearers, but now he is giving it out. He is granting it. He is giving it to the apostles. Do you see the progression? That's important that you see that. Now look at John chapter 5. If I was drawing this on a blackboard or whiteboard, I would be drawing it smaller to larger or lesser to greater so that you would see that it's building. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, it's the healing at the pool on the Sabbath. And then in verse 18, it's talking about Jesus being equal with God. And then beginning in verse 19, the context is the authority of the Son. And somebody read verse 22 for me. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That's the one? Yes. Oh, okay. Keep going. Okay. That all men should honor the Son, even as, their honor, as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son... Honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Okay, good. Thank you. So so the point that I want you to see there is, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Judgment and authority go together. Okay? 
So now let's look at verse 27. Uh, if I had the time, I'd read this whole section, but we got a long way to go, so I didn't want to do that. So somebody read 27 for me. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because in him, oh no, wait, because, he, I'm sorry, my bifocals went wacko, because he is the son of man. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> so he has been given him all authority to execute judgment, and this clarifies beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ not only was recognized as an authority, not only that Jesus Christ gave out that authority to the apostles, but it's been clarified that that authority has come from the Father. Now, folks, you just heard what Mark said, you just heard what Luke said, and you also heard what John said, didn't you? Question, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? say about himself okay in Matthew 28 it says in verse 18 and Jesus came and said to them all authority of heaven and on earth has been given to me and then he gives the great commission and so it's crystal clear that Jesus Christ has the legal authority that Jesus Christ has the final authority say so, the final authority. So we're back to Revelation, and we're going to take a peek at Revelation chapter 5. Let's go back to Revelation. And Revelation 5, verses 1 and 2 says, And then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And verse 3 goes on and talks about no one was found. And the reason is because there is no one, no one anywhere that can open it but one. And who is that? The one who has the final authority. And who is that? That is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Okay, good. Any questions about any of that? All right, we're back to Revelation 9. By the way, you remember that video of that uh, former detective who told you or told us uh, that was shown in church that we need to think like a what? Detective. A detective, okay? I loved what he did because when I was sitting there and relishing it and enjoying it, that's exactly how I was saved. Because I was in a Bible study in the Gospel of John, and I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Not at all. But I liked these church people. They were nice to me. They gave me free food. We had a baseball team, a softball team. I enjoyed these people, but I did not believe in Jesus at all. Until one day, the teacher said to me, Greg, do you know who Jesus is? Well, I was between a rock and a hard place now, wasn't I? I was like, hmm, well, let's see. Um, <clears throat> so I'm squirming a little bit, and, you know, and I'm changing position, and, you know, and I'm tucking in my shirt, <clears throat> clearing my throat. <clears throat> well, um, um, let's see, uh, Jesus... Um, no, I don't. He said, may I show you? I said, sure. So he opened up to Genesis 3.15. He went to Isaiah 53. He went to Micah. He went to all these Old Testament prophecies. And he kept flipping back and forth. Then back and forth. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament. What was he doing? He was showing me the evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And um, this went on for about an hour. And I am not an easy sell. Don't, don't think that I'm Milford Milk Toast, because I'm not. And I'll challenge him, challenge you, I'll challenge anybody. But I was blown away. 
because I came face to face with the truth of Jesus Christ. And after looking at all this evidence, after an hour or more, he said to me, Craig, what do you think about Jesus now? And I said, well, he's pretty awesome. He said, do you believe he's God? He showed me the resurrection. He showed me the virgin birth. He showed me the miracles. He showed me the prophecies. And I said, I do. He said, really? I said, yeah, really. He said, if Jesus asked you to do something, would you do it? Well, I hesitated on that. <laughs> I didn't answer that right away. I'm like, well, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I'd do it. I think so. I wasn't quite sure what he was going to say next, because <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what was going on. I mean, I, I was. It was crystal clear to me. It was like a light, a spotlight was right on the scripture. <laughs> And he made it clear and plain to me. And the evidence was overwhelming. The evidence was crystal clear. And he said, Jesus wants to be your Savior. And he walked through the Romans road. Most of you know that. Uh, Romans 6, uh, 23. And uh, Revela uh, Romans uh, 5, 10. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And, and all those other passages. Romans uh, 10, 9, and 10. And uh, that's when I put my faith. In Jesus Christ. April 23rd, 1973. Greatest decision I ever made. Greatest choice I ever chose. But I was following the evidence. Just like it said in that video. But we have to give people the evidence, don't we? We can't just say, you know what? You should trust Jesus. Because if they say to us, why? We need to be able to give them an answer. You can't say, well, you should do it because I did it. <laughs> Or you should do it because it's the right thing to do. You've got to give them the facts. You've got to give them the evidence from the Word of God. Scripture interprets Scripture, and Scripture introduces people to the subject of Scripture, and that is God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we see the authority of Jesus Christ. And in verse 2, it talks about uh, Revelation 10, 2. It says, And he had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. What does that mean? Well, John says, John MacArthur says, although Satan has temporarily usurped the sea and the earth, that is, taken it over, so to speak, this symbolic act demonstrates that all creation belongs to the Lord and, it, and he rules it with sovereign authority. Think about it. One foot on the land, one foot on the sea. What's the planet made out of? Land and sea, right? So it's talking about the sovereign authority over the entire planet. Now, there's a couple illustrations on your sheet. The first one says, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, which is who? Which is who? Satan. 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 Satan has flailed his arms waving his fist, declaring himself to be in control of God's creation. But in this gesture, Almighty God is symbolically demonstrating his absolute sovereignty over everyone and over everything. God is showing him and everyone else, I am in control. I can imagine that the dragon, the deceiver, is grating his teeth and screaming profanities at our Good Shepherd. Can you imagine that? Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the sovereign Lord God Almighty. Okay, any questions on any of that? That crystal clear? Good. How about verses 4 to 7? Could I have somebody read... Where are we at? Ten of eight. Somebody read four to seven for me. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. So I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up, as the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in 
and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, keep your finger there. I'm going to 2210, okay? I'm reading 22.10, and it says, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. So if you compare that with what you just read, okay, it says in verse uh, 4, Seal up what the seven thunders have said. And here it says in 22.10, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. You know, sometimes non-believers take verses like this and they try to twist them and contort them to say that the Bible contradicts itself because in one place it talks about sealing up and in another place it talks about not sealing up and they say there, see, that's a contradiction. And I answer those people by saying the contradiction is in your mind because it's a different time, it's a different context, and there is a time to seal up, and there is a time not to seal up. You want proof? Well, the proof is in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8, and I printed it on your sheet. You don't need to look it up. I, I printed it for you. Could someone read that for me? Pam, would you like to read it for me? Can I sing it for us? <laughs> For everything there is a season, and a time for every manner under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up which planet. Time to kill, a time to heal. Time to break down, a time to build up. Time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. Time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to keep silent, and a time to speak. A time of love, and a time to hate. A time for war, and a time for peace. I have an illustration that I'd like you to write right at the bottom there. And uh, if you write this name, I'm going to give you a name and a book of title, and then I'm going to read from it in a minute. The name is Ray Stedman, S-T-E-D-M-A-N, Ray Stedman. The title is a question, and the question is, is this all there is to life? Is this all there is to life? And I'm holding that book in my hand. I'm going to hold it up for a... Uh, People online, that's the book. Is this all there is to life? And the subtitle is Answers from Genesis. Any of you know the name Ray Stedman? Is that the guy from Ernest of Fame? From where? Pastor Ernest of Fame. No, this is a theologian who was with the Lord, has been with the Lord for many years, but he has many books, and he's a, uh, he's a conservative theologian. And uh, what I want to do, down the bottom it says, a time to love and a time to hate, okay? Um, have you ever thought about that, that hating is God's will? That God wants you to hate? God wants you to learn how to hate? And if you have not learned how to hate, you have missed something in learning God's will for your life, because God's will is for you to hate? And there's several things you should hate. There's several things that you're commanded to hate. There's several things that God expects you to hate. Give me some examples. Sin. Sin, yeah. That's the big one. <laughs> that's Pastor Joe. Sin, that's right. We are called to hate sin. And if you don't hate sin, you've missed something in your Christian training because you're called to hate sin. Okay, that's, that's the big one. So let's go a little smaller or a little more. What else are we called to hate? Mark? Well, 
what we were called to hate what God hates. We're called to hate what God hates. That's an excellent answer. And the reason why that's so good is because uh, I don't have the passage in front of me, but in one place it talks about seven things the Lord hates. You've read that before. And it goes through those seven things. Well, there you go. There's a whole paragraph for you. But that's not all. That's not all. Okay? Let me read Ray Stedman on this. He says, There is a time to love and a time to hate. When is it time to hate? Think of young Abraham Lincoln the first time he saw human beings sold on the slave blocks in New Orleans. Y'all know that he was the president, but do y'all know his history? Do you know his context? Do you know his background? I've studied it. It's fascinating. I'm not going to go into all of it now, but there's a whole lot there. Ray Stedman says he felt hatred rising in his heart. He resolved that if he ever he resolved that if he ever got a chance to smash slavery, he would do so. Lincoln's hatred of slavery was perfectly appropriate. There is a time to love when it is right that we should extend our love to somebody who is hurting, someone who is feeling dejected or rejected, lonely or weak. And so from Ray Stedman, he's, he's making it crystal clear that there is an appropriate time to love and there's an appropriate time to hate. And when Abraham Lincoln saw these slaves on this slave block, uh, kind of like a... Um, a flea market, you know, or a um, auction. Who will give me $10, $10, $10 for this notebook? Well, these slave blocks had slaves. Who's going to give me $50 for this young girl? $50, $50, $60. And they sold them like cattle. They sold them like sheep. They sold them like goats. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln observed that in New Orleans. And Abraham Lincoln was, was pricked in his heart. He was convicted in his soul, and he said if he ever had the chance, he would abolish it. And he did, and he wrote a document. What's the name of the document? Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation, that's exactly right. And so slavery became illegal in the United States as a result of that. And um, we should hate sin too. I can think of a whole lot of things I hate. One thing I hate is abortion. I think abortion is murder. I hate it. And I use this point in counseling sometimes, by the way, because um, I've had, I have have had, or imagine a counselor having had, that's a better way to say it, uh, people who have made uh, terroristic threats or have done violence against other people. And they think they're justified, you know. It's right for me to smash his window because he's an abortion doctor. Well, no, that's not right. I mean, I hate what an abortion doctor does when he performs an abortion, but that doesn't give me the right to destroy his property or to hurt his life because we are in a land of civility and we have laws in our land and we have laws in the Word of God and the Word of God tells us to follow the laws of the land as long as they don't contradict the Word of God. And so there is a time for love, there is a time for hate. But the point that I'm making is, you have two verses in Scripture between Revelation 10 and Revelation 22 that seem conflicting, where one time he's told to seal up, and another time he's told not to seal up. Different time, different context, different circumstances, both are correct. There's a time to seal up, there's a time to open up. And that's exactly what happened. It is as if God is saying, not now, John, not now. Imagine John asking, when, God? When? God answered John's question in Revelation 22.10. And in Revelation 22.10, the short version is, what God is saying is, now, John, now. <laughs> Now's the time. There is time with God's unfolding plan of redemption. Okay, so then he raised his hand. Look at verse 5, Revelation 10, 5. We have just a couple of minutes. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea 
and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth that is in it, and the sea and what is in it, and that they would be no more delay, and so forth and so on. So we have um, an oath here. Now, there's a sheet in your packet that looks like this. Okay? And this is uh, a copy of a change in the law. The law was changed in 2021. In 1966, it says that the civil service, uniform services, take the following oath. I, A, B, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office of which I am about to enter, so help me God. That was written in 1966, and that has been in force up until... August 22nd, 2021, because it was revised. And that's down the bottom of your sheet. And it says, all but the quoted language is omitted as obsolete. And it says in the middle of the paragraph, the words, quote, an individual, except the president, dot, 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 meaning some materials being left out, in the civil service or uniform services are substituted for any person either in the civil, military, or naval service, except the President of the United States, end quote. The second sentence of the former Section 16 is changed to read, quote, this section does not affect other oaths required by law, end quote. I I'm trying to say two things by this handout. Number one, oaths are important, and we have an oath that was written in 1966. Now, that's the date of this. And it's been given to uh, all of our service military personnel for, for years and years and years. That's number one. And number two, it was revised on August 22nd, 2021. And that revision is there, okay, showing the historical revision notes. And I'm saying all this to say that in our government and in our country, oaths are important. And... Uh, in this passage in Revelation 10, you see the angel taking an oath too. And then in verse 6, it says that there should be no more delay. No more delay. John MacArthur says this initiates the last plagues of the day of the Lord, indicating that the time of the disciples anticipated has come. The prayers of the saints will be answered. Okay. So remember, we are in a pause or an interlude. Six trumpets have already occurred. This declaration is clarifying that the seventh and final trumpet is about to begin. When does the seventh trumpet begin? It begins in 1115. And um, 11.15 says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. I'm going to stop there. And so what happens is, between 10.1 and 11.14, we have this interlude. Okay, We're not talking about the events of the tribulation. We're talking about this little horn, which we haven't gotten fully into yet. Um, and then um, the two witnesses, which... Um, I've added in this Bible study, but it's really in the heart of the next Bible study. And um, we're just on the brink of the seventh trumpet that will be sounded shortly. And I am at 8.02, so I need to stop here. And I'm going to draw a line right above the mystery for verse 7 on page 3. And next week or next time, we'll finish up uh, pages 3 and 4. And then we'll go right into Bible study number 9, which is part 2 uh, of this Bible study. Any questions about anything we've said tonight? Well, thank you so much. God bless, and uh, be safe going home.